Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Blake. Actually, I'm pleased to say I'm no longer a postdoc. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Apologies. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah. So the 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 let's say the ecological uh, setting of my talk, the thing of interest, um, as I like to say, is would be abrupt transition of community compositions that can occur along continuous or smooth environmental gradients. Uh, but and there are many ways you could approach this, of course. And as but the actual object and sorry, yeah, the in in this view, the communities. Uh, what is important for me is, is that communities of, of species that that have a lot of interaction with one another. So this is just a a classic a figure of an ecological network where there's a, a very vast. Uh, complexity of of interactions. The the the, the links are interaction between uh, the various species. In, in this example, it's just a classic uh, terrestrial uh, ecosystem. And so the object of study, by opposition to the thing of interest, will be a deterministic dynamical systems uh, where you have many variables that represent the abundance of of the species uh, that that interact with one another. another. So it's uh, obviously a a caricature, a very simple model for what is actual reality, and it's it's not super obvious whether or not it's relevant. But it encompasses two main ingredients, in my opinion, which is the exponential growth of of uh, individuals uh, in living systems and interactions between uh, various populations. So there's, there can be intra-specific interactions and inter-specific, and they're encoded in this um, uh, this, num this parameter AIJ, which is a, a matrix of interactions. And such models uh, can be studied from this perspective of ecological assembly or ecological patterns, where there can be invasions uh, and extinctions. <coughs> All right. so. Within this, uh, everything I will say for, from now on is 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 uh, correct within this mathematical uh, setting. Uh, so deterministic uh, dynamical system, which again, it's not so clear that it's the most relevant one uh, view to take, but it's the one that I use. So within this uh, th this this framework, uh, um, a friend of mine did the, his PhD looking at uh, abrupt turnover. So it's uh, Kevin, Kevin Yoto, and he was interested in those um, uh, patterns of showing abrupt community shifts along a smooth gradient. And so here, this is simulations that he, he did of like Lot Cavaltera systems uh, of the form that I showed before along a, a, a certain gradient. And the different panels show different strengths of competitive interactions, basically. And the curves are abundances of species uh, along this gradient. And what you see is in the top part, is, uh, what happens there is that there's very little interaction, pretty much none. And so you have gradual turnover along this gradient. But in the middle uh, panels, you, you see much more um, like identifiable communities that then shift discontinuously to, to one another. And if we look at uh, what's underlying Underlying uh, these shifts, there are uh, instances where there are alternative uh, states. Whereas for a, for a given, for, it's pretty obvious in in this panel here. For a given environmental conditions, there could be different possible states. And as we shift, uh, change the environmental condition, there can be uh, abrupt shifts between states. All right. So I wanted to understand a little bit better uh, what were the conditions for these these um, abrupt shifts to, to occur. And what is clear, very quickly apparent when you when you think a bit about it is that they always come from uh, the onset of either an extinction or an invasion. And of course, an invasion doesn't need to create a shift. Invasion could just, uh, a species could gradually come in at, at larger and larger population size as, as the environmental becomes more favorable to it or decay uh, gradually and as the environmental conditions are worse. 
And but clearly in, in those cases where there are drop ships, that's not what, what happens. The species was not present and all of a sudden it, it is. And as it comes in, it brings about um, a, a rapid change and a discontinuous change in, in the state. And it can occur also for an extinction, it seems. So I wanted to understand why and what, what makes it so or not so. So in the first uh, part, I'm going to focus on the uh, invasion aspects. And so we can uh, dial down a bit the complexity at this stage and really th think of just two species where you'd have a resident species and a species that, that is uh, potentially invading. So each time this, this index uh, zero means the, the invader. Um, all right, and so what we know from uh, classic co coexistence theories that a species can invade if its initial growth rate when rare is positive. So in those sim such simple models, this, uh, this is a term like this where uh, N1 would be the, the steady state of the, of the resident species. And so if, we, if we, we have different possible scenarios that we could map as a function here of the uh, in, uh, invasion fitness. So it could be like a um, linear, a linear gradient of conditions that are, that are more and more favorable to this uh, newcomer. And look at what kind of abundance that means. So of course, if the, uh, if the invasion fitness is negative, the, the, the equilibrium abundance for the newcomer is zero. But as it crosses zero, we can graph the equilibrium abundance and we have different scenarios here and we can do the calculation to, to figure out what what is this the equation of this of this curve and it and it looks something like that you can just do it pretty quickly but what we see here is that there are different scenarios as i said we could have this curve grow uh, with a like relatively a shallow slope which means that it will never cross the state that it would have reached if it had been alone. Or it could potentially cross this state. And it, when it does, it typically means that it is driving the resident to extinction. There could be like instantaneous replacement. That is a very singular scenario. Or an even more bizarre uh, case where this there would be a uh, bi-stability where coexistence, this uh, red line is complete, is, is not stable. And as soon as the invader has posit reaches positive invasion fitness, it would immediately uh, jump to uh, its uh, carrying capacity, driving the, driving the resident to extinction. And there is a little zone here of potential conditions where there are two possible states either with or without the invader. And what determines if we are in, in stable, if coexistence can be stable or not, is the sign of this uh, quantity that I've called F, F naught, which as I'll explain, has something to do with uh, feedbacks uh, of the invader on itself. And from this uh, basic equation, you see that if feedbacks are negative, there can be coexistence. So it's the, those two rows. But if it's uh, if feedbacks are positive, this is this situation here, there can be uh, no coexistence. And whenever there's an invasion, it leads to an abrupt turnover. So what's the general, let's go and think about the, the general argument here. So you can think of R0 to be the growth rate of this invader, but thought of in a bit of a abstract sense where it's the growth rate uh, that it would reach if you could keep its abundance fixed and let the rest of this of the potentially very complex community that surrounded uh, settle to this particular abundance. So mathematically becomes a, a, an explicit function of its own abundance. And its intercept where at zero, it's its growth rate when, when rare. So it's its invasion fitness. And so you have invasion if if you this invasion fitness is positive. So that's a, a classic, uh, a classic notion. But you can go a little bit beyond rarity and just do a linear expansion 
and, and of, of this function. So you'd have the first constant term, which would be the fitness, invasion fitness, plus the second term, linear in the abundance, since it's what I'm uh, expanding uh, on. And this term here that multiplies the abundance is the total derivative of this growth rate function. And it's what I call the feedback. And you see that from this expression, if it could, if it remained linear, if, I, if it could properly uh, express this function uh, for any abundance, you would say that the invasion ends when the growth rate becomes zero. So just by uh, writing the equation of this becoming zero, you get uh, what we saw for the two species case that the equilibrium abundance is the ratio between fitness and feedback. But if those feedbacks are positive, the interpretation the interpretation now is that coexistence is not possible. So because as soon as you have just a little bit of abundance of that species, this abundance generates a positive feedback on its own growth rate, leading to a runaway process that has to stop somehow. And it cannot stop uh, within it, it, unless some species go extinct. And that, that's something I, I will try to show. And from the perspective of these abrupt shifts, it means that there will be an abrupt transition at the moment where the invasion fitness becomes positive. Uh, here's an example based on just a really basic random simulation of a blood cavalier model. So I have a certain community here. These lines are their abundances. And what I'm changing uh, on the x-axis would be some environmental condition that are favoring an invader. And so as long as it cannot invade, it's not really changing the other the abundances of the other species. But there's a moment where at the at the red at the red star here that the invasion fitness becomes positive, and immediately you see uh, this continuous shift in the community state. So if we go back to our two species and try to think of it a bit more in, in those terms, we have this growth rate function R naught as a function of abundance, and we have various potential scenarios. As I said, the, the intercept is the invasion fitness. And then we have the slope of those curves, those lines, is the feedback. So as long as the feedback is negative, it means that the slope is going down and can reach and can uh, reach the, the horizontal axis pretty quickly. But if it doesn't reach it quick enough, then it might mean that it's pushing the resident to extinction. And if it's actually not going down at all, it for sure leads to the extinction of the resident. And then at that point, it's left alone and it's just going down on its own then, uh, intrinsic density dependence. And here what happens when you are in the alternative uh, stable state regime where you may have that uh, you have that the um, feedback is positive, but the, in, the invasion fitness is negative. So there cannot be any invasion unless the abundance is large enough to be beyond a certain uh, threshold that then allows the growth, the super exponential growth, since it's accelerated due to this positive feedback, leading to the extinction of the resident. And then uh, again, the the, in, the, um, the, the, the normal um, intrinsic density dependence reaching the carrying capacity of the invader. So if you, you can map out these two, the, all these different scenarios by, by, as a function of fitness and uh, feedback. And this is what it looks like for two species. You have uh, on, on the x-axis, you have feedback, and on the y-axis you have invasion fitness. So classically, to have invasion, you need positive fitness. So that's that's in the, in the top half. And in the uh, positive feedback, you have these more um, strange 
p uh, potentialities of alternative stable state or irreversible turnover. And I and you can think of this to be irrevers irreversible because if you reverse the condition that allowed the invasion fitness to be positive, you would still not eradicate the invader. It would need you. You would have some form of hysteresis. You would have to go down below until conditions were much worse than for the invader than they were at the moment where it was allowed to to invade. You have zones of coexistence and more like classic reversible turnover, where if, if conditions were uh, taken back to what they were before, you would have coexistence again, and then uh, only the only the resident. And what's nice about this, and I, I won't go too much in, in the details, and but but you saw that the 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 general the the argument is quite general, is that it can hold for much more complex uh, systems. And uh, here's the example of what it looks like if you did uh, not two species, but many species communities in which you would put some uh, random invaders and look at the feedback of that invader and the invasion fitness of that invader and recorded the, the outcome. So the outcome being no invasion in red, um, coexistence in blue, turnover in black and, and green, and a zone of uh, alternative uh, stable state where it, where the invasion, the success of the invasion depends on the initial abundance of the invader. All right, so that's for this, the qualitative scenarios of this invasion, but what we are interested in is the, the impact that this invasion can have on the community. And already there, I've showed a hint that there is a relationship between what kind of scenarios you're in and what kind of impact there is. Since you see here the, the fraction of the, the fraction of extinctions in the community community. And clearly it's it's much worse when you are in uh, in positive feedback, although it's not univocal which direction is worse exactly. But if we hadn't known uh, all this, you could ask, you could ask, can I predict the impact? And the most basic guess you, you could, you could think of, uh, if you're not considering feedback is to look at whether invasion fitness alone. So the, how good are the conditions for the invader at the moment it comes in? Is that a good predictor of the impact it will have on the community? And of course, in some cases it might be, in some cases, it might not, but if I take a bit of a generic approach, what I show here is that it's not a great predictor at all. There is some correlation, but it's pretty poor, especially considering that we are in a very idealized setting of a deterministic dynamical system. Like we're, we, we don't want to make a theory that that is okay with like a vague cloud of point. And the different colors here uh, are there to reference to those uh, invasion scenarios. So blue would be coexistence, uh, black and, and green like turnover. All right, so how do we go uh, a bit past this naive guess and, and try to use what we have learned from the effect of feedback? And so to understand how we can predict those impact, it's useful to, um, to, have a, to do a little abstract thought experiment where you have an invader coming into a community, but you consider three cases. One where actually there is no community, it's alone. Um, you have the actual scenario that you're interested in where you have the invader in red. The invader has some impact on the community, of course. And the, the third abstract scenario would be that there is a community, the invader is not alone, and it's, and it's affected by this community, but in it, it itself, has no impact, no effect on the community. And so by comparing these three scenarios, we can understand how we can uh, more accurately predict the impact. And so in terms of, of growth curves, uh, those three scenarios that I re re represented here can be mapped as uh, three curves. So invader alone would be this blue line here, It'd be like in, a, in the most simple model, would be like logistic, um, logistic linear model of growth rate. Uh, 
you'd start from a certain value of, of initial growth rate and go down as the as the invader as the abundance grows until you reach the steady state. The other abstract scenario in black is this line here, where you'd start from the invasion fitness in the presence of the community. But the density dependence is pretty much fixed by the inherent properties of the invader and has nothing to do with uh, feedbacks uh, from the community, since the community is not really reacting to the invasion. And in between, you have the actual scenario. And the intuition here is that if you go from this first, it, it is how much you go from this first line where there is no impact until towards the line where the growth curve where the invader is actually completely alone that you can measure the impact because in this uh, artificial example here you have removed there has been first one extinction then a second and then a third and now the residents the there is no more resident species and the invader is completely alone so that would be like a maximal impact and our little definition of, of fitness corresponds basically to just a, a local analysis of this curve close to uh, close to low, low abundance. So the, the, the initial slope, the, the intercept and initial slopes of, the, of these curves. So keeping in mind is very basic um, linear approximation. So we don't we don't not considering changes of slope anymore, just have one slope. What we can do to, to um, improve our estimate of impact is to uh, ask here, this red line, how close has it got from the blue line, uh, knowing that it has started from the gray? So how big is this difference compared to the overall? So this quantity here, A, divided by B. And these quantities, they, they involve the feedbacks, the intraspecific feedback of the invader and the one that it is actually experiencing in the community. And it's also involving the, the, in, the interspecific intrinsic growth rates of the invader as well as uh, the, the invasion fitness. <clears throat> and so we can use that to make a prediction. So that's the prediction just based on invasion fitness. And for the same communities, this is the prediction of impact. Uh, so impact here, by the way, is the relative abundance shifts of the various species. And so if we use uh, 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 this, this information and feedback to predict impact, we get a, a much better prediction that uh, nicely not perfectly, but nicely orders the, the various uh, qu qualitative invasion scenarios. So blue is uh, when there is coexistence. Um, black is uh, turnover, but with uh, but with negative feedback, and green is 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 positive feedback effect. <clears throat> All right, so it's that's. That's pretty much tells you how much you can learn from this local analysis of of feedback and inv and invasion fitness to predict uh, impact. And what we see is that it it matters a lot this information on feedback. But what determines uh, this feedback is a is a question that that is of interest to us. And what will what can be relatively intuitive at this stage is that this feedback has something to do with the community's response to the invasion. Um, and so it's sensitivity to some form of perturbation. And in that sense, it relates to, to notions of stability. So that's what I'm going to try to sketch uh, really quickly now. So that's that's the the the, the the overall schematic drawing of, of this idea. You have an invader, has some interactions with the resident species, acts as a perturb, not, not necessarily all, maybe some of them, but as it perturbs those resident species, the resident species perturb others and so forth. And then this overall 
response of the community has then some form of a feedback on the invader via the interaction from a resident to, to invader. So if we formalize this a little bit, we have a small increase in, in abundance of the invader, but that's going to perturb the resident species and feeds back on the growth rate of this invader. And in terms of interactions, this is what it looks like. You have, that's the growth rate initially, so the invasion fitness, but now you have a perturbation of, it, of this invasion fitness that has to do with how much the community has reacted to this small um, chain uh, presence, this presence of, a, of this invader. And you can write down how the, the species respond in terms of the uh, invader abundance and the interactions. And it involves this matrix V, VIJ, that importantly can be uh, entirely determined from the interaction matrix uh, in the community. And it's the inverse, basically the inverse. And why is it the inverse? Well, for those who are a bit used to um, to community models, the inverse is something to do with net interactions and uh, indirect interactions that can take long interaction pathways to connect uh, any two species. And so once you've, you've done that, you wrote this like that, you see that there is a certain shift in growth rate that is a function of shift in abundance. So mathematically, it's the derivative of, um, of the growth rate as a function of abundance, the total derivative. And it takes this form, which at least in Lotka Volterra models, and we, we made some effort to show that it's more general, but for Lotka Volterra models, it's entirely a function of, of, uh, of interactions, of per capita interactions. And this VIJ matrix, you can think of it a bit differently. You can think of it as the net, as I said, the net interaction between the species, so the partial derivative of, an, of the abundance of a given resident species with respect to a small change of the growth rate of another. It's so what encodes the sensitivity of the community to environmental perturbations, to, to, change, to variations in growth rates. <clears throat> and it's not a coincidence that it is pretty much the inverse of the feedback. If you look at what feedback is here is the derivative of growth rate with respect to abundance, whether, whereas the uh, net interactions, they're the derivative of abundance with respect to growth rate. And in fact, you can show that the two are, are formally related and that this formula that I wrote here is what mathematicians know as the block inversion of, an, of a matrix. Okay, um, but what's interesting, if, if you think, um, if you think of it in this term is this notion of feedback, it's clearly important to understand the impact of an invasion, but it's something you could think about also for in a setting where there is no invasion, where you're actually thinking of the resident species and potentially their extinctions. So a bit the mirror image of what we've talked so far, we've talked about invasion, but if you wanted to think of extinctions, you might, it might be interesting to look at the kind of feedback that a given resident species feels uh, from the rest of the community. And that, that is going to lead me to <clears throat> a notion of, of um, abstract notion of a keystone species. So here it's no longer about invasions, but about extinctions. And I, I'm going to call this those particular species that go extinct keystone because they will have just as those invaders had an abrupt effect on the community when they could invade. Such species can have an abrupt effect on the community at the moment where they go extinct, even though they're going, they might go extinct uh, gradually. So if you, if you think of a certain community steady state, you may look at the growth rate of a resident species as a function of its own abundance. Again, in, in, and I insist on that, although it might seem a bit weird uh, here, but I insist that I'm talking about the growth rate as a function of the abundance. If, if you could imagine that this abundance could be kept fixed and let all the rest of this, the system 
equilibrate to account for the, this given abundance. So it'd be, mathematically, it's a way to make it an actual function, explicit function of the abundance. <clears throat> and so suppose that there is a species in the community, and it's a steady state community, that experiences a positive feedback. That means that if you could increase a little bit its abundance and let everything settle, then you would see that the effect on the growth rate would be positive. It would increase, increasing the abundance would increase the growth rate. And you could check, you, uh, just in passing, you can check that this condition exists or not just by looking at this matrix V uh, and its diagonal elements on the, the resident value K. So the matrix V is the, is the interaction matrix just inverted. And check that it's negative. So it's there's a there's a bit of a mental gymnastic to go from one to the other. But the point, the only point I want to make here is that it's not hard to check on a model whether this is the case or not. But uh, such a situation seems uh, con contradictory, and, and indeed I thought it was not possible. And I, it was only when a student of mine came up with. Um, with examples that it was happening that I realized that I had missed something. But why does it seem contradictory? Well, if they had, if there were positive feedback, it would imply that this particular species, in moment where it was coming into the community, would have been a, what I call a hard invader. So an invader with a positive feedback. And what we saw is that if a, an invader with positive feedback cannot coexist with all of the the rest of the community. So it seems contradictory that a species that is coexisting with others would have a positive feedback. But this is only contradictory if the, the community we're thinking about actually existed in a stable state before this species came. But what can happen is that the rest of the community, so the community without this resident species, species K, could not have existed without it. And so that's why it makes this resident species a keystone species, as its extinction will cause an abrupt transition. Because the community cannot exist without it. <clears throat> so here's an example. Uh, in this example, I, I made that I found a bit at random, just, just playing around with some simulation. There are, there are, there are, two, uh, there are two things happening. First, there's a certain community. And I'm varying some environmental gradient a, a bit as before. And at first, I have one species coming in, the, the dotted black, and it's a soft invader in the sense that it's coming in and it's coming in gradually. And as it in, invades, it's not causing any particular uh, shift in the community. But what it is doing, however, is that it's making the red one a keystone species. So. This red species, I, I've identified it precisely because it experiences a positive feedback and it didn't before the invasion of this first one. So that's why it's a, that's why I showed this particular example. It's not representative of, it's not a generic example. It's one I found by cherry picking a little bit. But what's important for us is what happened as I keep increasing this gradient, the keystone abundance is declining, and at some point it reaches extinction. And at that moment, there is an abrupt shift in the different species, and some are going extinct. You cannot see, but below you, there is one that is going extinct. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, what we've seen so far is that the density dependence of the growth rate function of, of a given species, either it's an invader or an actual resident, encodes some uh, fundamental features, either about invasions or, or extinctions. And what we just did is, is a simple like local analysis, like really basically just looking at the value near zero and in, uh, in the first derivative of this function. And it provides a little extinction of uh, of classic invasion analysis. It explains that the, the role, the combined role of invasion fitness and feedbacks, and showing that those feedbacks are related to uh, 
uh, net interactions between species, uh, which are connected, of course, to indirect interactions, and stability or sensitivity to perturbation, if you will, and forming particular assembly patterns. So for the ones that I was interested in, it was those you know, abrupt community composition along smooth gradients. And what we saw is that alternative uh, states or like these rather what we showed, what we explained is how you could get up those abrupt shifts and abrupt shifts are actually related to alternative states. And what they require is either a hard invader or a keystone resident. But in both cases, what they share <coughs> is uh, positive feedback loops. And it's well known that alternative states require positive feedbacks. And here it's uh, the, um, the contribution here is to identify formally what are those positive feedbacks concretely, like mathematically in such models. And what we, and we see that those, what is important is that positive feedbacks, they are coming from interactions uh, with the rest of the community. <clears throat> okay, so I have a few, I don't know how long I've been talking, but I think Oof, I think I just, oh no, oh, there you go, sorry, I may, I, <laughs> I lost my screen. Um, yeah, I'm just going to finish the, the talk uh, quickly with um, a perspective work where the invasion now is not necessarily of ecological uh, origin, it's not coming from outside, it's not an exotic invader or oh, even doesn't have to be exotic, but it's not another species per se, it's coming from within via the process of a mutation. So here the invader is a mutant. And overall, this doesn't make much difference formally than considering an invader a mutant or, or just another species from how I'm going to uh, model it. But there is one thing, however, that that is of importance is that the invader is similar to an ancestor species. So this ancestor, ancestor species I index by A and the idea is that I have certain attributes, um, the relevant attributes of the ancestor are changed by some mutation into other attributes that are close. So epsilon, those little, those epsilon numbers are small. And I say small in a vague sense here. And what you, what you can show pretty uh, directly is that the invasion fitness <coughs> of, the, of, the mutate, of the mutant is of the order of epsilon. So it's an incremental change of fitness. And then there are two cases. You have the, when we look at the feedback that the mutant will, will feel, <coughs> It will be of also of the order of epsilon, only if mutant ancestor interactions are different from ancestor ancestor interactions. So it, meaning that the two species can differentiate one another you know, in a way. <clears throat> if it's not the case, if interactions between mutant and ancestor are, in, are the same as intraspecific ancestor ancestor interactions, then the feedback is of, of the order epsilon squared. And it turns out that this is the usual setting for the classic setting for adaptive dynamics is more in this case there, where <clears throat> you would have no distinction in interaction between uh, intra within uh, ancestor and between ancestor and, and mutant. But in any case, what is clear is that as epsilon goes to zero, so if this mutation is having a very, very small effect on the on the relevant attributes, uh, the invasion becomes a two species problem, just a problem between ancestor and mutant, uh, regardless of the rest of the community. And so a question I, I have, and I've been working on this with uh, recently with a student of mine, um, Louis de, de Vres, is how small epsilon should be for the fixation process to be a two-body problem only. So where community is only there as a certain scene 
fixed scene in which the fixation of a mutation plays out. And I'm just going to show right now some, some very pre preliminary results. So this is the two body problem. And I've reproduced here, uh, if you remember, the fitness feedback map that determines the kind of, of outcome of an invasion, the scenarios. And in terms of fixation, you'd have in blue uh, replacement. So you have positive fitness that basically takes over. There's a take, take you take the mutation takes over and uh, fixes in the population completely. There is also zones of potential coexistence or failed invasion. And then this, uh, let's say, yeah, strange area where the fixation could occur if the mutant population like came in at the large enough density. But importantly, classic classical adaptive dynamics like pretty much takes place on this vertical line where there is only two outcome, no invasion or replacement. And then uh, for those you know, then you go, you go up from infinitesimal mutation to infinitesimal mutation, you uh, climb up the, fit, the fitness landscape. All right, and so here are, uh, oh, damn it. Sorry, <laughs> when I touch something, it closes my screen. Uh, here are some uh, some numerical uh, results, uh, preliminary, where what we show here is how, when in the presence of a community and sufficiently strong interactions with respect to the size of the mutation, there can be qualitative mismatch. So green dots have basically moved a bit here we're only representing the mismatch where some uh, outcomes are not what they should be based on the, just this simple two-body prediction between ancestor and, and mutant. Where you have some cases where coexistence is occurring whether you'd expect just a, a classic a normal replacement. Uh, in some cases there is no, the, the, the mutation completely failed although you would have expected to succeed. Um, and vice versa. And so in this case, the fixation is not only determined by the fitness increment, but importantly, the community, the rest of the community, so the biotic environment, uh, participates in the selection process. So this means that in those cases, and might not be the most general case, but in those cases where mu the mutation is sufficiently large with respect to the sensitivity to perturbation of the community, uh, selection and environment uh, become inherently intertwined. Okay, so I'll stop with this and I'd be happy to, to answer any question if you have any, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>